I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my professional responsibility class. Here we're going to be talking about an ethics opinion that the ABA put out in 2020, number 493, which tried to clarify and um, expand on the newer rule 8.4G, which is about discriminatory actions by lawyers. Here I'm going to be focusing just on the hypothetical examples that were provided in that ethics opinion because they're very helpful and they're likely to appear as test questions either on my exam or to be turned into uh, multiple choice questions on the MPRE at some point. So students should be familiar with them. I have another video or another lecture where I actually talk about Rule 8.4G itself and some of the related comments from the ABA. Here I'm just going to focus on the five hypothetical situations that from the ethics opinion in 2020 that I think are likely to show up as test questions. So let's dive in. Okay. And again, this is ABA formal ethics opinion 493 from 2020. They give some examples about rule 8.4G and because they're presented in sort of a quick Q and A format or question and answer format, they're really easy to turn into multiple choice questions. So let's proceed here and we'll move on to number one. Hypothetical number one says a religious organization challenges on First Amendment grounds a local ordinance that requires all schools to provide gender neutral restroom and locker room facilities. And so let's say this um, denomination or church has a religious school, private school, and they don't want to do this. And so the question is, would a lawyer who accepted representation of the organization violate rule 8.4G? And the answer is no. And I have to say something here, a number of religious organizations and religious lawyer organizations like the Christian Legal Society were uh, um, openly opposed to the new rule 8.4G when it came out and very critical of it and kind of presented all, a number of hypothetical scenarios or nightmare scenarios where they thought that they would be punished for representing religious organizations or being members of religious organizations. And the examples that we're going to have here are actually um, the AVA confronting head-on uh, um, examples that were provided by critics of the rule and trying to answer them and reassure people and allay their fears about rule 8.4G. So they explain this situation does not even involve the type of conduct that's covered by Rule 8.4G. The black letter text of the rule underscores this by explaining that the quote, paragraph does not limit the ability of the lawyer to accept, decline, or withdraw from representation in accordance with Rule 1.16, end quote. So in other words, a lawyer is still free to um, represent someone who has unpopular views or to refuse to represent someone because the lawyer doesn't agree with their position or doesn't feel comfortable with it, or to withdraw from representing a client that the lawyers become uncomfortable dealing with. Um, so nothing in 8.4G limits the lawyer's ability to um, decline representation or withdraw from representation as long as the lawyer is, required, is following the requirements of Rule 1.16 that apply to any situation where you decline representation or withdraw from it. And if you're not clear on that, I have another video or series of videos about 1.16. It continues. In addition, the next sentence of 8.4G further emphasizes that it quote, does not preclude legitimate advocacy or advice or advocacy consistent with these rules. Some individuals may disagree with the position that the lawyer in the hypothetical would be defending, but that does not affect the legitimacy of the representation. Let's move on to hypo number two or hypothetical number two in ethics of this ethics opinion. A lawyer is a speaker at a continuing legal education program or CLE that's about affirmative action in higher education. This is an issue we've had some recent Supreme Court decisions about. We'll probably get more Supreme Court and Circuit Court opinions about soon. So this lawyer expresses the view that rather than using a race conscious process in admitting, let's say, African-American students to highly ranked colleges and universities, those students would be better off, this lawyer says, attending lower ranked schools where they would be more likely to excel. 
Now, would the lawyer's remarks violate Rule 8.4G? And the answer is no. Even though a CLE program would fall within Comment 3's description of what constitutes conduct related to the practice of law, the viewpoint expressed by the lawyer would not violate Rule 8.4G. And that's important, and that's the kind of the main point of including this hypothetical, is to highlight the fact that 8.4G doesn't um, only relate to how you treat your clients or a, an opposing party, but also covers conduct related to the practice of law, like teaching a you know, CLE course or giving an a information session or uh, things like that. And But here, the uh, expressing a viewpoint that uh, a, a, criticizes a, a certain policy is not in itself a violation. The lawyer's remarks without more don't constitute conduct that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know is harassment or discrimination on the basis of, of race. It's just a, a legal opinion or policy opinion. It continues, quote, a general point of view, even a controversial one, cannot reasonably be understood as harassment or discrimination contemplated by Rule 8.4G. So you won't be subject to discipline. No lawyer will be subject to discipline under 8.4G for taking an unpopular position publicly. The fact that other people might find the lawyer's expression of social or political views to be inaccurate or even offensive or upsetting is not the type of harm that's required for a violation of this rule. So you can say something that sounds outrageous to other people and you may have fewer friends or they may think less of you. They have a right, to, just like you have a right to your opinion, they have a right to think less of you because of your opinions, but you wouldn't be subject to discipline by the state bar under this rule. Let's move on to the next hypothetical, which is about membership in um, the religious legal organizations like the Christian Legal Society. Uh, three, a lawyer is a member of a religious legal organization which advocates on religious grounds for the ability of private employers to terminate or to refuse to employ individuals based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. So th there are groups, advocacy groups, that advocate that um, religious, that private employers, um, if they're if they have religious reasons for doing so, shouldn't be forced to follow um, other the, the same anti-discrimination laws that would normally apply. And so the question is, will the lawyer's membership in this legal organization constitute a violation of Rule 8.4G? And the answer is no. As with the prior hypothetical, Rule 8.4G does not forbid a lawyer's expression of his or her political or social views, whether through membership in an organization or through oral or written commentary. And furthermore, to the extent that such conduct takes the form of pure advocacy, it would not. It would still not qualify as sufficiently harmful because it's not really targeted at any individual. It's just saying that you wish employers uh, um, had more freedom to do things based on their religious convictions. And so, someone can disagree with that. Someone can get offended that there's anyone who holds a different view than theirs. But you wouldn't be subject to discipline. And this is true, even though the Supreme Court has held that discrimination based on a sexual orientation and gender identity would violate Title VII normally. It's not a violation of 8.4G to express a view that that whole decision is wrong. And so we've had a number of Supreme Court decisions recently that have overturned decades of precedent or have um, kind of changed the landscape for certain legal rights or civil rights. And just like a lawyer before those decisions could have said, could have taken the position that the prior precedent and long, long-standing precedent was wrong, a lawyer now could criticize the, a Supreme Court's decision that changed the rules. Let's move on to hypothetical number four. A lawyer is teaching as an adjunct professor at a law school clinic, and they're, so they're supervising a student, a law student at the clinic, and the lawyer has made repeated comments about the student's appearance and also made some unwelcome, non-consensual physical contact of a sexual nature with the student that the student didn't want. Would this conduct violate Rule 8.4G? Hopefully this is an easy one for you. Yes, yes. This is an obvious violation 
Uh, and it demonstrates the importance of making the scope of the provision broad enough to encompass conduct that may not necessarily d fall directly within the context of the representation of a client. So uh, keep in mind that even though we have a lot of other rules that affect how lawyers have to treat their clients or opposing counsel and opposing parties or interact with a, a judge or a tribunal, Rule 8.4G covers a lot of sort of law adjacent activities that a lawyer might do, like um, working as an adjunct professor at a law school clinic and supervising some of the students, the lawyer could still be subject for, uh, to discipline for sexual harassment, basically, in that context. Okay, last one. Hypothetical number five, a partner or and a senior associate together in a law firm have been tasked with organizing an orientation program for the new associates to familiarize them with the firm policies and procedures. Very common that a partner and maybe one of the associates will pull all the associates to, to, together. It could be summer associates or the people who just started in the fall at their new firm now that they've passed the bar and they get pulled together for a little orientation session. So during one session, the partner remarked, rule number one should be never trust a Muslim lawyer. Rule number two, the lawyer says, should never be never represent a Muslim client, but of course we're not allowed to speak the truth around here. And the question is, would the part these remarks by a partner violate Rule 8.4 G? And the answer is yes. And this is a helpful hyp hypothetical because it clarifies that even though this doesn't involve the direct representation of a client, the lawyer's not saying this to a client or to an opposing party, saying it to the subordinates of the firm. Um, the, it violates 8.4G. And that's true even if the co-teacher, the associate involved, doesn't happen to be a Muslim. The partner's remarks are discriminatory insofar as they're harmful and they manifest bias or and, um, hostility and prejudice against Muslims. And furthermore, the partner surely knew or re should have known this. And the fact that the comments may not have been directed as a specific individual would not insulate the lawyer from discipline. And that's an important takeaway from hypothetical number five, is that it is possible to violate the rule, even if you're not um, hurling insults at an individual or doing something that's directed at a specific individual. If you're creating an environment that is going to make some individuals that come in contact with your firm is likely to make them feel attacked or mistreated, this is um, th that would violate the rule. Because the remarks were made within the law firm setting, they are related to the practice of law, even though it's just an orientation session for the new lawyers. And moreover, given the partner's supervisory role, the remarks may, I think, are likely to influence how similarly situated firm lawyers treat their clients and opposing counsel and others at the firm who are Muslim. And not only Muslim, but maybe other minority faiths or unpopular uh, religious groups are may feel like, okay, it's uh, this firm is hostile towards uh, unpopular religious groups or minority religious groups. And that concludes our quick overview of the five hypotheticals. Again, I hope that the students find this helpful in preparing for test questions. From the ABA standpoint, just as a reminder, this was an attempt to answer the main objections um, uh, or criticisms that have been raised against Rule 8.4G when it was first published.